آج پروگرام جو منعقد کیا ہے ہم نے وہ لیکچر نمبر تھری ہے سیریز کے لحاظ سے اس سے پہلے دو لیکچر ڈلیور ہو چکے ہیں مختلف ٹاپک پہ اور آج عمران اکثر صاحب صاحب وہ لیکچر ڈلیور کرے گی بیسیکلی یہ لیکچر اس لیے رکھے جاتے ہیں تاکہ ایجوکیٹ کیا جائے اپنے ہر اس میں ایجوکیشن ہم بھی حاصل کرتے ہیں اور جو سامعین ہیں ان کے لیے بھی یہ ایک موقع ہے اب میں منتبیس ہوں جناب صدر سے کہ وہ آئیں اپنے خیالات کا حضار بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آج کے لیکچر کے لیے میں نے ایڈریس کی تھی چودری مانگ صاحب صاحب سے اور مشکل سب جیسا ہے انہوں نے ہمیں بڑی تو کچھ سارت ان کا کچھ ہوئے تھے کہ یہ انگول ہوئے ایز نیٹو کے ہائی کوئی دوزار چھے ہیں سپریم کوئی کی انگولمنٹ ان کی دوزار سلا کی ہے یہاں بھی اچھی جائے رہی ہے ایلے میں جو ہے وہ لیکن ہم بھی مسکی سے ہوئی تھی آپ کمرشن ان کارپریٹ لاؤں میں کار کو بار ان کا دو ہزار نو کا ہے اور یہ جو پراؤڈ سن آر ایک گیٹ لگی ہے جو یہ پتیا سن کا میں ریکویسٹ کروں گا کہ وہ آئیں گا آج کا لکھتے پر الحمدللہ 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 السلام والسلام والا محمد الامین اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرحیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم The Honorable President and members of the Executive Committee Leonard Senior members of the Bar My Leonard friends, brothers and sisters First of all I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Honorable President and members of the Executive Committee for allowing such a humble student as me to share his thoughts with the learned members of the Bar. And I would also like to express my appreciation for this admirable initiative taken by the Honorable President and the members of the Executive Committee for professional development of young lawyers. It will create a conducive environment for learning and dialogue where members of the bar can exchange ideas, experiences and knowledge. And I think if continued, it will benefit not only the young lawyers, new entrants of the bar, but it will also raise the collective professional standard of our Indian bar. It is indeed a commendable endeavor. Now, today's topic, as you know, pertains to procedural law. And uh, it is, I believe, impossible to overemphasize the importance of a working knowledge and understanding of procedural law for an advocate. I believe that without such an understanding and knowledge, an advocate cannot hope to discharge his duties to his client. You must have heard the saying that procedure should provide stepping stones for achievement of justice and it should not be stumbling blocks in the way of achievement of justice. It is true. However, procedure can provide stepping stones for achievement of justice only in the hands of an advocate who has enough proficiency in procedural law. Otherwise, it can very quickly turn into a stumbling block that can trip up the advocate and ultimately his client. And unfortunately, I have seen too many young lawyers being embarrassed by irritable judges because they are not familiar with or they do not have sufficient knowledge of the relevant procedure. The Honorable Chief Justice of Pakistan, Mr. Justice Umar Azhar Bandiyar, was one of my teachers at Punjab University Law College, Lahore. 
And a friend of mine and I used to visit his chambers quite often. And that friend once asked Mr. Justice, Mr. Umar Asabhan Dial, if he then was, uh, which subject we should focus on the most at law school. And his answer was simple. Procedure, he said. Focus on procedure. Procedure means the pathway that you must walk in order to secure your rights. Now, you may have a right in law, you may have a very good case in law, but if you do not know which court or forum to take your case to, if you do not know how to draft your pleading, who to impeach as a defendant or respondent, what court fee needs to be paid, and how to present evidence, just to say a few things that are covered by procedure, then you will have a very hard time in securing the rights that you are fighting for. So what is the purpose of today's lecture? An average law graduate is familiar with CPC, CRPC, Ganamay Shahadat Order, Court Fees Act, Court uh, Valuation Act, and so on, and even to some extent, perhaps, Civil Court Ordinance, because you are taught those subjects to some extent at law school. But that is not the case with the High Court Rules and Orders, which now equally, perhaps, in some cases, more important, are not taught at law school. So that means that you have to familiarize yourself with this very important legislation when you start your career on your own. In my experience, a lot of young lawyers simply rely upon hearsay knowledge. Hearsay knowledge, they hear a thing from some senior there, they hear another thing there, and that's about it. They are content with that. They do not go and open the book. And what, what does that mean? It means that they sometimes know what the law is, and they may be right in that, but if you ask them, they find they're not quite able to put, to put their finger on that provision which actually states the law. And in my experience, this sina basina knowledge is not enough. You go before the court and you cite the principle of law. I've heard many young lawyers say, well, I've heard it from the seniors. But the thing is that in practice, and my learned senior friends will, uh, will agree with me, that you have to sometimes read the law, reread it, maybe read it a dozen times before you actually understand what it means. The word of the law is very important. It recently happened to me. I was engaged in a case in which an ICA had been dismissed. During Ramadan, I was engaged to file a CPLA against this civil petition for leave to appeal against it before the Supreme Court. When I read the judgment authored by a very, very competent judge, I first thought that it was very difficult to, to file a logical CPLA against it. I spent my entire week in that way. I thought I had no case at all. To an extent it ruined my ease as well. I was thinking about it constantly. But then after Eid, when I sat back on my table and started drafting the petition and read that provision again, it dawned on me in a moment of epiphany, if you like, that I had been reading the provision entirely wrong and the judge had also, so I believed, and hopefully the Supreme Court will agree with me, the judge had also misread it. And it all hinged upon a single word. In that particular case, the distinction between a judgment and uh, it's an order, an administrative order. So the real purpose of today's lecture is to give you some food for thought. You are all qualified advocates. We are all equal. It is possible that tomorrow you will be standing on one side of the rostrum and I or some other learned senior member will be standing on the other side of the rostrum. So we are all equal. The real purpose of today's lecture is to give you some food for thought. 
and to hopefully kindle an interest in you to go and read the rules yourself. You cannot just rely upon this talk or upon something that your senior tells you already. You have to read the law yourself in order to have any hope of understanding or developing a reasonable understanding of it. Enough to give you confidence to go and stand at the roster, at the bar before a court and address a high court judge who has a lot more experience than you, who has read the law probably in a lot more depth than you have. So you have to have that understanding to give you the confidence. Now coming to, I hope by now you have all been able to get your hands on the handout that I have distributed. This, that the, for those of you who would be interested in reading the rules, they are, I've given the link to the High Court website where you can find these rules. Now these rules are subordinate or delegated legislation. And as lawyers, whenever you come across subordinate or delegated legislation, that is rules or regulations, the first question that you must invariably ask yourself is what is the source of the rule making power? In other words, under what provision of law have these rules been made to determine the status of those rules? Because to make law, as you know, under our constitution is the function of the legislature. And when some other authority says that I have made these rules and this is also law, the first question that you naturally ask is, where did the legislature give you the power to make these rules? So I have started, as you can see in the handout, with the High Court rulemaking power, which in the current constitution is to be found in Article 202, which reads that subject to the constitution and law, a High Court may make rules regulating the practice and procedure of the court or of any court subordinate to it. Now you may ask yourself that this was made in 1973, but the High Court rules and orders are much older than that. So I have also listed the provisions of the previous constitution. In the 1972 interim constitution, 1962 constitution, 1956, going all the way back to the Government of India Act of 1935, all of which contain similar provisions empowering the High Court to make these rules of procedure. And then, to, to go to the very inception of the High Court, the High Court of Judicature at Lahore, which at that time was the High Court for the provinces of, of uh, Punjab and Delhi, was constituted by the latter patents dated 21st of March 1919, which were issued by the then King. And Section 27 of the Letter Station also empowered the High Court in somewhat similar terms. The language there is more regal because the King was speaking there, but it essentially achieves the same purpose. It empowers the newly created High Court to frame these rules. And then in the Code of Civil Procedure, 1908, you will also find section 122, which with slightly different language also achieves the same purpose. It reads, as you can see from your handout, the High Court may, from time to time after previous publications, make rules regulating their own procedure and the procedure of the civil courts subject to their superintendent and may by such rules annul, alter or add or add to all or any of the rules in the first schedule. Now the first schedule in CPC as you all know contains the, the orders and rules. They can also be amended by the High Court. And by means of making amendments to the High Court rules and orders, the High Court can also make amendments to those orders and rules containing the schedule of the CPC. 
Now, the high court rules and orders comprise six volumes. Six volumes. So there is no need to be scared. Normally, when you say volume, it means a bound book. When you say a certain subspecies of Quran is in six volumes, that means you will have six separately bound books. But that is not the case here. All these six volumes are contained in one book, which I have here, much like CPC. The volumes deal with different subjects. Volume 1 deals with practice in the trial of civil suits. This is more or less ferry materia with CPC, Kanun Shahada order. It basically brings together the various legislations dealing with the procedure before the trial court. And uh, the difference is that these rules are in a narrative form. Narrative form. So when you are dealing with, for example, a certain stage in the trial or proceedings, you will find in these rules, if you read the High Court Rules and Orders, you will find that the various provisions from CPC, Kanun Shahadat Order, Court Peace Act, Food Valuation Act, etc., have been brought together dealing with a certain stage of the trial. And they are in a simple and narrative uh, form. So if you read these, you will find it much easier to comprehend the relevant provisions in CPC and those other legislations as well. So you can also use this as a key to understand those rules. What if two can deal with special jurisdiction and accounts, for example, guardians and boards, official receivers, succession certificates, civil court accounts, and so on. What if three, for those of you who are interested in criminal law, which I'm not, uh, deal with practice in the trial of criminal cases. What in four, superintendents in control of lower courts, including inspection of subordinate courts, process fees, service of processes, handwriting and fingerprint examiners, malpanas, oaths and affidavits, you might find that very useful, and prohibition of touting, something that we should all be familiar with. Unfortunately, this provision is often ignored. Now, volume five is what I shall be focusing on today more, because it deals with the rules relating to proceedings in the High Court. And volume six simply contains forms that can be used in various proceedings, and you can use them, you can take a look at them in your own time. Now, the next thing is what should be the mode of citation of a provision contained in the High Court Rules and Orders. Now, although it is called Rules and Orders, that is a bit misleading because it is not structured like CPC. In CPC, you go to the schedule and you find orders and rules, and you can cite them as Order 41, Rule such and such, Order 43, Rule 1, and so on. But unfortunately, you can't do that with the High Court Rules and Orders. That would have made life much easier, but it is not the case, unfortunately. So instead, each volume, each volume contains chapters, and then each chapter contains parts, and then each part contains rules. So when you are citing a, a specific rule before the court, you will have to start with the volume, and then work your way in, or downwards to the rule or sub-rule. It is kind of like the table manners, Western table manners. When we were at Lincoln Day, you have to attend some dinner. And um, we were not used to eating with pork and knife at that time. So they told us, the teacher would tell us, when you go to the Lincoln Day, and uh, don't be baffled by the number, because you have a lot of cutlery before you maybe four or five glasses, a lot of uh, forks and knives. And the simple rule was, start from the outside and work your way in. Same applies here, start with the volume and then work your way down. So for example, to cite a rule about constitutional remedies, you would say volume five, chapter four, part J, and rule such and such. 
for the most part, especially in so far as the procedure for proceedings for lower court is concerned, as I've already said, these rules are fairly material with CCC and Kamala Shahabat, etc. But in addition, they provide for matters not covered by CPC and those other legislations. It was humanly impossible for me to cover all of them. As I've said, there are six volumes and a very thick book. This is without commentary, by the way. This is just the rule. In CPC, you have a thick book with commentary. Here, this is just a barrack. So it was impossible for me to cover all the rules or even all the subjects, all the topics. I have therefore chosen the ones that I think you are most likely to encounter in your litigation, specifically at Lava Pindi Bench. But it does not mean that the other rules contained therein are not as much important. It just, it just means that you will have to read them yourself. Now, coming to the actual rules. I have chosen, I really believe, about 17 provisions that I shall be covering. It shouldn't take more than 40 minutes or so, hopefully. Now, the, the first one is that you often come across in demarcation cases or hut chicken cases. And uh, you will often have heard about someone, some senior counsel or the court saying that the person, the officer who goes for demarcation has to fix three permanent marks, etc. Those instructions which require that are contained in financial commissioner's instructions. Financial commissioner was the predecessor of the current board of revenue. The, the current board of revenue, as you know, was, uh, was uh, established under the West Pakistan Board of Revenue Act of 1957, but prior to that we had something called the Office of the Financial Commissioner. And on the request of the High Court Justice, the Financial Commissioner issued these instructions, which you can find in Volume 1, Chapter 1, Part M, Rule 4, and you can cite them as such. I will quickly give you an overview of them because they are probably one and a half days long and I cannot hope to dwell, I cannot possibly dwell on them for too long. So one point is obvious that he has to establish three points, the other is he has to use the field map and then he has to compare the results with the field map and one thing that I have noticed is the other two requirements are often violated that he has to explain to the parties what he is doing and then he has to record the statements of the parties at the end recording their satisfaction with the procedure. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? He makes the demarcation, the parties are present, doesn't follow this procedure, the parties go before the court and then protracted litigation starts. So if this procedure was followed, probably a lot of litigation would be, could be avoided. Anyhow, when you come across a report, you can judge it with reference to these instructions and then maybe if you are lucky, you could make a, an arguable point to argue before the court. The next is failure to seek consequential relief. As you know that section 42 of the specific relief act says that when a plaintiff is able to claim further relief than a mere declaration. So for example, if a suit for declaration is filed and he should have sought a decree for possession as well, but if he omits to do that, then the suit is liable to be dismissed. He cannot be given that simple decree for declaration. But what happens is that in practice, people omit to do that, courts sometimes grant a decree or they do not decide that question at the appropriate stage. And then the case comes either before the High Court or it goes up to the Supreme Court and I've seen some judgments where the courts have to come up with innovative ways to save that suit. So for example, they invoke principles like the party should not be non-suited on technicality 
or that the place can be amended even before the Supreme Court. If this rule was followed, all of that would be avoided. What does the rule say? Volume 1, Chapter 1, Part M, Subpart G. It requires that in a suit for a declaration of title to immovable property, where the defendant denies that the plaintiff was in possession of the property, on the date of the suit, the court should, first of all, these are the important words, first of all, meaning as a preliminary issue, decide this point. And then if the plaintiff is not found to be in possession of the property on the date of the suit, this suit must fail unless the plaintiff is amended. So if this question was decided at the appropriate stage, then a lot of uh, time and trouble could be saved. But it seldom happens. But if you are equipped with this rule, you can call upon the court in a case to decide that question in the first instance. The next provision that I have chosen deals with uh, Transfer of Property Act. The, there are some judgments that were passed in the period of the relevant notifications which I have listed here, which say that the Transfer of Property Act, although it is such an old legislation, still does not apply to the province of Punjab. However, if you go and take a look at the Volume 1, Chapter 1, Part N, Step Part 3, it gives you certain notifications. And you can see two notifications specifically. One is notification dated 30th of December 1974, which declares that Section 54, 59, 107, 118, and 123 apply to the entire province, including urban and rural areas. Then they had a change of heart, the governor for the government, and they replaced that with a notification dated 22nd of November 1978, which now says that these sections apply to municipalities, or in other words, urban areas alone. What does that mean? These sections deal respectively with sales, mortgage, lease, exchange and gift. And uh, basically they require one simple thing that all of these transactions have to be in writing and that writing must be registered if the property is worth more than rupees 100. Now despite the lapse of more than 100 years, we are still dealing with oral transactions and the courts say that the Transfer of Property Act does not apply and that leads to a lot of uh, protracted litigation which could be avoided if this procedure was properly followed. Now the next provision is limitation in interest court the, the, the The following provisions now basically deal with the litigation before High Court. Volume 5, Chapter 1, Part A, Rule 4 deals with that subject. And uh, the limitation of 20 days is provided, which starts from the date of judgment, the date of judgment, not from the date of copy. And this is basically a reproduction of, um, as you can see in the footnote, footnote number 7, Article 151 of the Schedule to the Litigation Act. But the next provision is important. It says that limitation is to be computed as a, there is no need to attach a copy of impugned judgment. That could come in handy in a case of urgency for you where you, your repetition has been dismissed, there is some urgency in the matter and you can go and file an ICA without having to wait for certified copies. That's how you can use it. But there might be cases where you have somehow either wasted those 20 days or were not for, for some reason able to file an ICA within those 20 days. The same provision says <coughs> the same provision says that the limitation is to be computed in accordance with provisions of section 12 of the Limitation Act. 
There are judgments, again I believe, part in opinion of this provision, where they have come to the same conclusion, but without reference to this rule. They stated that just because, I've given them here, just because you need not file certified copies does not mean that section 12 does not apply. Section 12, by the way, says that uh, time consumed in obtaining certified copies can be excluded from the period of limitation. But now you have this concrete rule that you can rely upon seeking confirmation of delay if you are not able to file the appeal within 20 days. The next provision is the remedy against office objection. Office objection raised by the Deputy Registrar Judicial, if he returns your case with objection, you may challenge that before the Chief Justice or the Administrative Judge. Now in practice, we instead of filing a miscellaneous appeal, we simply write on the objection memo put up before the court and the case is then fixed as an objection case the next day before the court. But this is the provision under which you have that right. In the Supreme Court, you have to actually file a civil miscellaneous appeal. Certificate of counsel in review application to the next provision. This is an extra requirement. You have to, as counsel, you have to give a specific The judges were impressed and they allowed the application. Otherwise, I would have had to get an affidavit from the previous counsel who was not willing to cooperate, obviously, because I was substituting him. And I might have had a difficult time convincing the judges. But this rule helped me. That is uh, an approved for reporting judgment. I have given the reference to that in the footnote. Now the next one is leftover cases. A very interesting provision which is never followed in practice. It says that the, there are two aspects in it. The daily cause list of the week shall be issued immediately on the preceding Wednesday. We do not receive it until late in Friday, uh, Friday evening or maybe sometimes on Saturday. Not getting up enough time to prepare weeks sometimes or at the very least, it ruins our weekend. But the next one is even more important. All leftover cases of the week shall be fixed on the corresponding day of the week following the next week. For instance, a case left over on Wednesday, the 24th of November 1965, will be fixed for Wednesday, the 8th of December 1965. That doesn't happen. You get a case fixed through an application for early hearing. On that day, for some reason, unfortunately, the case doesn't get taken up. It is left over, and then you have to file another application for early hearing. And if you are lucky, the case will get fixed up for a couple of months. But if this was followed, and why, what does it mean? It means that the cases that are now in the in circulation, as it were, they should first be decided. This is another, it is akin to another rule, a traffic principle, which is a very useful principle, but never used in this country, leading to traffic chaos. When you enter a roundabout, enter into a roundabout, the cars or vehicles that are already in the roundabout, you have to give them way. In England, it, has, it, it perfectly works very fine, like a well-oiled machine, no problem. But here, we have roundabout, the vehicles that are already in the roundabout, they are not allowed, we do not give them way, leading to traffic jam. So this is a similar rule, that the, the cases that have already been fixed, they should first be decided, disposed of. That doesn't happen. Make it in the Now, the next provision is notice to outstation lawyers, a very useful provision again. <coughs> useful for those advocates who do not live in Rawalpindi or other major cities that have been listed here. Basically, the seat of the High Court. 
hypotensive. Then you are entitled uh, that the deputy registrar concerned shall fix the actual date sufficiently in advance and give to the said advocate notice thereof by a registered postcard, PC card. Such date shall not be altered except by an order of the bench concerned or of the first division motion bench if the case is not listed before a particular bench. This is also it comes in very handy, it is useful when your case has been dismissed in default, for example, when you have to explain delay maybe. So you go and uh, you stand before the judge and you say, I come from Atak or Sikwal and I did not have notice. And the, the judges are visibly irritable because they've heard all, all these stories. So if you refer to this particular provision and say, well, I come from a station which is outside of the city, I did not receive a, uh, such a notice. So we set aside the dismissal order. It might be of some help to you if you know this rule and if you have it in hand when you go to the court. Again, if these rules will be only helpful to you if, if you have either this book with you or if you have printed the relevant provision from the High Court website. To so have something in your hand, do not rely upon just your, the word of your mouth. It means nothing to the judge. Give him something concrete. So, the next provision is composition or numerical strength of benches. Volume 5, Chapter 3, Part B. So the simple rule is that all cases are to be heard by single benches, except the ones that are listed here. They are to be heard by division benches, or if the Chief Justice specifically orders by a larger bench. They are regular first appeal with jurisdictional value exceeding that of the district court prescribed by the Civil Court Ordinance 1962, which after the 2016 amendment is uh, 5 crore rupees. If it is less than that, even an RFA will go to a single bench. RFA under Land Acquisition Act exceeding 5 crore rupees. Now these are important because sometimes these provisions baffle young lawyers. They see one RFA being heard by a division bench, another by a single bench, and they do not know which provision determines that. This is the one that determines it. So there is a list of cases. I'm not going to read out uh, because you have the handout. The next provision is powers delegated to the registrar. This, in my experience, is the most unutilized provision that there is in the, in the High Court Rules and Orders. A couple of months ago, I even drafted a letter that I intended to send to the Honorable Chief Justice that this provision should be made use of. But then, for some reason, I didn't. And maybe if the Honorable President and the senior members approve of it, we could do that. What do they do? There are many provisions in it, but a couple of them are more important than the best. It says that the registrar, if he is uh, someone who, is, who has judicial experience, and normally they do, they are sessions that is, or additional sessions that is. If they have that experience, then these, pro these uh, powers can be delegated to them. What are those powers? Power to dispose of all matters relating to service of notices including substituted service, power to receive and dispose of an application to increase legal representatives, power to receive and dispose of an application for withdrawal of an appeal or consent decree or order. The time of the Honorable Judges is much too precious. It is public time which to be wasted on such petty matters. These can be disposed of by a registrar. He could be given a separate room and he could issue notices and substitute his service, etc. In the Supreme Court of Pakistan, there is a corresponding provision where a lot of powers have in fact been delegated to the, to the registrar and they are exercised by him. If you are not satisfied with them, then you can obviously file a, uh, an appeal against that order. But in the High Court, they remain unutilized. And you see that uh, there's, a, there's a very thick pile of, uh, of files before the judges and 
a lot of them basically are ones in which notice is not being served or in which you have to implead into representation. You come and you wait for two hours and what has happened, the case gets called and you know, a high court judge, a high court judge simply orders, okay, repeat notice. That takes one minute of its time or maybe two minutes. But when you calculate, it all adds up. He only has maybe two hours, that is 120 minutes, maybe 150 minutes in a single bed. And those two minutes are very precious. The next provision is habeas corpus. Habeas corpus, that is when someone is in legal detention or improper custody, you file a habeas corpus petition that the person be brought before the court. Two provisions deal with that. Two substantive provisions that is. One is the section 491 of the Criminal Procedure Court <coughs> and Article 199 1B1 of the Constitution. The power under section 491 is also essentially a power of the High Court. It is the power of the High Court which the High Court has then delegated to the session judges. Section 491 says that the High Court may from time to time frame rules to regulate the procedure in the cases under this section. And the volume 5, chapter 4, part F gives those rules. One important provision is that you have to file the application on an affidavit. Now this is ignored in, in, uh, in practice. Council simply file a, just an ordinary petition as they would in, in any other case like an ordinary petition. But this provision requires that you have to file it on an affidavit. The very, at the very least, it should be a detailed affidavit. So all the contents of the petition should be reproduced on the affidavit. It shouldn't just be that formula, run of the mill, four line affidavit. And then there are other provisions, appointment of bailiff, etc. I'm not uh, going to read them out again because the time is precious and uh, you have them here in the handout and being qualified advocates of these people to read them and understand in your own time. Volume 5, Chapter 4, Part J, Rule 1 states that uh, the same rules which apply to Section 491 petitions also apply to petitions for habeas corpus under Article 199, the same rule. Uh, which also has some implications. Uh, one implication being that although ordinarily it is said that CCC applies to repetition, but in this case, in a habeas corpus petition, CCC might not be of that much relevance. And this again is this is very important in a case I am arguing before a bench now, but uh, I don't have time unfortunately to go into the details. It can be it can be of significance that you have to argue that it is not a civil matter, it is a criminal matter. Questions of fact and repetition. This is very important. And a very uh, I'm often very disappointed by the way that judges sometimes dismiss your petitions in limited by simply saying, Well, this is a question of fact, how can I decide it? How can I decide in limited? without even calling upon the other side to file an affidavit. And I submit it to you as food for thought. When does a question become a disputed question? It can only become a disputed question when one party asserts it on affidavit and the other party comes, files a counter affidavit and then on oath it denies those facts. That is when it becomes a disputed fact. And even then, this rule says that the High Court can decide questions of fact. But this provision is often ignored. Obviously, there will be some cases in which recording of evidence will be necessary, absolutely necessary. So in those cases, obviously, a trial will be needed and repetition may not be adequate, but in most cases they are. But in any event, your petition cannot and should not be dismissed in limiting without calling upon the other side to file counter affidavits. I have in the footnote given some judgments as well, but the main rule says um, 
This is uh, I, paragraph number 13 in your handout. Rudu says that which petitions to be accompanied by an affidavit or affidavits in proof of the facts, and you do that. Without that, your petition will not be entertained. However, the next rule says that respondents in which petitions should be required when notices are issued to file counter affidavits. I have never seen counter affidavits being filed with the comments. Officials file, if, if at all, they take the time and trouble to file comments. They never file counter affidavits. And the judge simply says, well, this raises a question of fact, how can I decide it? You can say, the next rule says, my lord, rule number seven says, all questions arising for determination of such petitions shall be decided ordinarily upon affidavits, but the court may direct that such questions as it may consider necessary be decided on such other evidence and in such manner as it may be fit. And in that case, it may follow such procedure and may pass such order as may, as may appear to it to be just. Now, in some cases, some judges, depending on their inclination, sometimes depending on who is standing before them, do make orders even for appointment of local commission to go and inspect the spot and file a report, even a writ petition, questions of fact. They have no qualms about appointing local commission. But sometimes, without any justification, go and stand before them with an urgent petition and they say, well, this raises a question of fact, how can I decide this? Without asking the other side to file counter affidavits. This is the answer to that objection. The next The next point, and for those of you who are, who are getting bored, I only have four more points to get to. The next point deals with, uh, again, I've seen some counsel being embarrassed by technical judges, and there is no shortage of them. Uh, they say that uh, you have either given a certificate at the end of the petition which does not disclose the fact that your client previously filed a petition and uh, sometimes you do not know it honestly. Sometimes your client conceals it from you but sometimes you are not familiar with this rule and you make that mistake. Young lawyers obviously. And you omit to give a certificate. That might be when it does in practice lead to a lot of avoidable embarrassment. I have seen counsel being embarrassed because the judge confronts them saying, your client filed a petition, you did not give a certificate. This is the rule that requires it. So make sure that you file a proper certificate. The next provision is the written statement with petition. I'm sure that most of you have heard it from judges and from seniors, that when a petition, a written petition is admitted to regular hearing, then you have to file a written statement. This is the rule that provides it. Volume 5, Chapter 4, Part J, and Rule 6, you have to file a written statement. This, uh, although I have not included in the handout, it, I, it has just come to my mind that uh, most, some judges issue pre admission notices. Pre admission notices. There is no concept of pre admission notice in the high court rules and orders or in any provision of law. And in a book, Judging with Passion, written by the former Chief Justice of Pakistan, uh, Mr. Khosa, will you remind me the name of Arthur Sayyid Khan? Yes, the Honorable Mr. Justice Arthur Sayyid Khan Khosa. And he calls such judges lazy judges. Who issues, he said, who issues free admission notices as lazy judge, who does not who does not completely comprehend the case, he doesn't comprehend it enough to dismiss your petition and uh, he does not he does not want to admit it either to be a free issue the free admission of it. There is no concept of that. And recently the Honorable Mr. Justice Mr. Vakasa Usahib has also given a judgment to that effect. But obviously it is something 
excuse me, this is something for the judges to follow. The second last, well, the, the last two provisions are um, similar, they deal with the same subject. Court fees on restitution. Court fees on restitution. Now the this rule says that a court fee of rupees five hundred shall be payable on each petition. The word the, the key word here are each petition. But no court fee shall be required in case a bit is required in respect of the detention of any person by or under orders of any public authority. The second key word public authority. Now this gives rise to two points. The first one is that no court fee is payable on habeas corpus petition. But which habeas corpus petition? The one where the order of detention has been made by the by some public authority. But not where not where you file a habeas corpus petition for the recovery of a minor who is in improper custody of the father or mother, according to your case. That is where you have to file a court fee. But the, the word each petition has uh, given rise to some controversy and contradicting views. I have listed here two cases. One is an unreported order and dated 24th of January 2017, where the Pindi bench has held that it means, this rule means that you have to pay a 500 rupees court fee on every petition regardless of the number of petitioners, regardless of that. But then there is another reported judgment, CLD 2007 Lahore, in which it has been said that you have to pay court fee according to the number of petitioners. In that particular case, there were more than 300, <coughs> 300 petitioners. So, 300 multiplied by 500. And what had they done? They had challenged in an order of the Board of Revenue. All of them were parties for it. Now, I submitted to you as food for thought that this is a charging provision and it should be construed strictly. And to me, the view of the Ravapindi bench in an unreported order seems to be the correct view. And you should only be required to pay 500 rupees on a petition regardless of the number of petitioners. Because the word used here is on each petition. It doesn't say for each petitioner for some other such words. And the same applies to, and, I, and by the way, I have used this order in the high court to, to get overruled objections of the office. So at Double Pinky Bench, I believe this order is being followed. But anyway, if uh, you come across some officer in the high court who demands more court fees, you can use these orders. And then the same provision, similar provision, um, which is the next rule, which applies to intra court appeals and requires 1,000 rupees court fee, this time on each appeal. Not for each appellant, but on each appeal. So you should not be required. To, you should not have to pay more than rupees 1000 on each appeal. Now, these were the points. Obviously, there are a lot more in that thick book. We could talk on and on. But these are the points that I wanted to cover. I hope, I hope that I did not make things overly complicated for you. Uh, I was asked by some senior members of the bar to speak in Urdu. I purposefully chose not to do that. We may like it or dislike it. And I have always been an advocate of Urdu being used in all walks of life. I do not approve of English being used. This is one of the major hurdles that we have in progress, especially in law. But I may like it or dislike it. It is not for me to make policy decisions. 
the law that you deal with, the constitution, the proceedings of the court, the judgment, everything is in English. So I wanted to speak in English to encourage you to familiarize yourself to become more proficient in the language because uh, it's a good I would just say one thing at the end um, may God bless his soul Dr. Abdul Basit Sahab he was my teacher at Punjab University Law College and the first time when he came to our classroom to give us a lecture and he had a, those of you who know him he had a beautiful impressive deep-chested voice, not like my shrieky voice, it's a very beautiful voice. He would speak like that and you know, very impressive. And he asked us the first question, would you like me to speak in English or in Urdu? And he was, um, he always spoke in Urdu, always. And he was a graduate from the best universities in America. But he asked us a question, and being a cheeky student that I was, I said, Sir, uh, we are neither masters of English, or nahi hamu urdu mein madaka hasen. This is the sentence that I spoke. And he got so angry, he was curious, and he looked at me and said, Kya naam hai He said, Imran, Imran, you cannot become a lawyer. Give up the idea. You will never be an advocate. This is what he said to me. But then he said that articulation is the most important thing for an advocate. And it did, I say it with some degree of pride. He taught us for a year, and towards the end of the year, towards the end of the year, I was the only student that he praised. And he once again asked me, What is your name? And I said, Imran. And he said, in wrong, I can predict you will become an excellent advocate. So, because we, you know, focus on language. So, thank you very much for your patience, hearing. I hope you guys well come Thank you. I want to ask question that word, this word actually means because I have seen a lawyer who used this word even. The most celebrated lawyer in the history of Pakistan, Mr. Mandu Kadir. So I was shocked that how this word can be attributed to such a legendary lawyer in the history of Pakistan, the word Tao. So what does this? Because without rational application of mind, we attach such kinds of words with highly dignified and great lawyers. So please explain word, what the actual meaning of this word. For whom this provision is, how judges do type of doubting, etc. Although I did not deal with that subject, but I don't think that that question is relevant to high court rules and order. The question that you are asking seems to me to be about the conduct of advocates and some judges. I'm not going to comment on that. That is not the sense in which it has been used. You know, in our, there are words that are termed, termed used in a specific context, but then those words are also used in ordinary life. Ordinary life. A good example is, who is Shaheed? Shaheed has a religious connotation, but then Hindus also call their uh, you know, uh, the people who die for a good cause, shaheed or martyrs, and even political parties in this country call everyone a shaheed. So the word has a, has a proper connotation and it also becomes an, a daily use word. The sense in which you are using it is, a, is an ordinary sense. But the sense in which it is used here is basically it applies to those uh, non-lawyers, non-lawyers, you will see, or if you go to the civil courts, sometimes you see there are professional witnesses even who charge money to appear as a witness. There are people like them, busybodies, who make it their profession. They go and they gather clients. Sometimes they have a prior agreement with an advocate. Sometimes they just take a client 
to one advocate and to another to a third one, in the hope that when the, when the council agrees upon some fee with that client, he will give them a share of that. So basically, a person is a tout who gives, who brings you, he has no business, he has no concern with that particular case, but he goes and brings a client to you in the hope that you will give him some monetary compensation. He is a tout and he chooses you not because you are an, you are an exceptional advocate or, or uh, experience in that particular field, but because you have agreed to give him money. So his motive is not your professional skill, his motive in choosing you is not your professional skill, but the money. So he is a tout. That is the sentence which is used here. And I'm not going to give any uh, an answer to the, uh, you know, the, the political or other connotations of that word. Rule. I did not read it out. You can see it in uh, volume four. It actually gives a definition of the word doubt, and that is what I'm using to answer your question. First of all, along with the dusty body, I do appreciate and I must appreciate the for what a brief and for what a beautiful explanation of so many things, particularly. Good after having 22 years practice, I've never been gone to the uh, High Court Golden Volume in depth, as I heard today, as, I, as, as you told. One thing is always confusing for me, sir. What is letter pattern? So I would like to ask you to explain this, sir, as uh, you use in uh, paragraph number 2 of your first page, uh, section 27 of letter pattern, they did the one and one and constituting the High Court of Thank you. Very much. The question I would just like to add to this: the question as of today, latest patent is applicable or not? That is it. I have that here. If you have this particular book, it is at page number eight sixty nine. But uh, in other books, in other books or publications, it is basically an appendix to the High Court Rules and Orders. It was a kind of a charter that was issued by the then king of uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain, George V. And it has a very old language. Uh, it is um, basically like the, the rules or the basic statute under which the High Court of Judicature at Lahore was created for the province of Punjab and Delhi. It has a lot of provisions, uh, 37 in number, which basically enumerate the powers of the High Court and uh, they are the charter under which the High Court came into existence. They provide for the right of appeal and um, it, like I said earlier, there is also provision empowering the High Court to make rules and orders and so on. But basically it was, uh, uh, for, for your interest, I will just read the first few lines to give you an understanding of what it was. George the Fifth, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and of the British Dominion, Dominion being India and other overseas uh, Dominion colonies of England, beyond the seas, King, Defender of the Faith, Emperor of India, to all to whom these presents shall come greetings. Whereas by an act of parliament passed in the fifth and sixth years of our reign, reign and called the Government of India Act 1915, it was amongst other things enacted that it should be lawful for us, regal us, Shahana Bhazmin, by letter patent to establish a high court of judicature in any territory in British India. So he goes on to say that we create the high court. I don't want to bore you. And um, it lists the jurisdiction of the high court as well. But to answer the second question, we are now governed by the 1973 constitution. One thing that we often forget is that when you give a new constitution to a country, basically you are creating a new country. We don't realize that, 
because the territorial, uh, the, the territories remain the same. But when you give the, a new constitution, it is a new country. That is why in the 1973 constitution you have the definition of the country and you have also the, the names of its territories and so on. So basically, under, this is a new high court now that has been created by the 1973 constitution. Historically, it was the national statement, but now it is the 1973 constitution. And all the other powers have now been given in the constitution itself and in the, uh, the rules. So you will have to read uh, articles 175 and 172 and, and those articles to see what I, I mean. Thank you. I hope I answered the question. Mr. Sound, I would be thankful to you for just an exhaustive and extensive lecture dealing with that complete knowledge. And one question is, in this me especially uh, regarding limitations in intraprotopy. First limitation is available for contemplation. Whether it relates to the contempt act or ordinance or cycle through the order covers this kind of just but I believe that the High Court rules and orders are sure about that. They do not give any any limitation. But whether the contempt of court ordinance uh, so besides the limitation, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe it also does not give any limitation. There is there a effect? How, how much is it? 30 days? 30. Yes, so the answer is, is to be found in the contempt of court ordinance. Yes. Yes. In one of the footnotes, probably you may have written down, that the CCC Amendment Ordinance 2020 was struck down on the basis of an article in the Constitution that the High Court has the power to make rules with respect to the procedure. So my question is, if the Constitution provides High Court the power to make rules with respect to the procedure, can through legislation uh, an ordinance or an act could be passed which could change the procedure altogether? Or would it be done by the High Court? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. The, the basic lawmaking power remains with the legislature. In fact, if you uh, go to the handout, the, the, the rulemaking power under Article uh, 202, it starts with subject to the Constitution and law. So the, the, the main and as you know that the main body of CPC is elected by the legislature. And then the schedule is, uh, is those rules contain, orders and rules containing the schedule are made by the High Court or they can, um, they can be amended by the High Court. But why? Because, the, because section 122 of CPC and article 202 empower the court to do that. However, the power remains with the legislature. The reason that that amendment was struck down, that ordinance was struck down, it, it had other reasons as well, but the Honorable Mr. Justice Shahid Kareem uh, said that one of the reasons uh, that I'm striking down this ordinance is that it makes some fundamental changes to the structure of PTC, but without consulting the High Court. The High Court had just a, a, a while before that introduced some amendments uh, and uh, the legislature has then become made some dramatic changes uh, to the uh, to the procedure and the his lordship said that because the high court is not being even consulted in the process so i believe that the that what his lordship was saying was that at least the high court should be consulted but uh, the simple answer to your question is that the power remains that of the legislature so it can 